All right, so let's talk about the external structures that you find outside of the cell wall on prokaryotic cells. So um, the appendages that we have for movement include the flagella and the axial filaments. Flagella, um, I just mentioned the sperm with the little floppy tail. Um, you've got kind of a propeller, a microbial propeller with three main parts. The basal body that actually is the part embedded in your cell, the hook, which is kind of midway between um, the base of the cell, and then the filament that is the long tail that flops back and forth. With flagella, you can have basically two different arrangements. You can have um, a polar arrangement, um, which is what you see here where it's basically on the ends of the cell, or you can have a peritricus arrangement, um, meaning that you have basically hairy cell, they're everywhere. <clears throat> Excuse me, which you can kind of see here, where it's not just in one spot, it's kind of all over the place. Um, flagella actually allow, um, the bacteria to exhibit a, a behavior called chemotaxis. Okay. Chemotaxis is um, chemical attraction. They follow the smell of a chemical to a specific location. So chemotaxis is something that you actually do see in the human body. When there is an infection, chemicals get released and the white blood cells that go and fight that infection use chemotaxis to follow that chemical back to where the infection is so that they can attack. Bacteria can use that same type of chemical attractant. And by having that ability to use the flagella, it can actually swim to where it's being called to, if that makes sense. Okay. So <clears throat> Flagella don't allow kind of a smooth speedboat kind of movement. It actually is almost like a baby trying to roll to where they want to go. So it's a very kind of rough and tumble movement. They kind of tumble around, but they know they're going in this direction. So they kind of, you know, but they don't necessarily just straight shot it. So when we talk about the flagella, <coughs> excuse me, as a way of movement, we're not necessarily talking about the classical speedboat go from point A to point B. It's kind of a little random. They eventually get there, but yeah. Um, axial filaments are periplasmic um, flagella found in spirochetes. So axial filaments are actually going to be underneath this outer sheath okay so imagine putting um a spiral on your leg and then putting pantyhose over the top of that okay so you've got this spiral axial filament around the outside of your cell like what you see here but it's underneath something so it's kind of like a corkscrew it can move and it uses the fact that it has that ridge to kind of get it going, but it's underneath. It's not this independent propeller that's flopping around. Um, the external structures outside the cell wall. Um, in this case, we're talking instead of movement, we're talking about appendages for either attaching to things or for mating. So fimbriae. Fimbriae are these short little um, bristle-like fibers all over the surface of the cell. And on the cell picture on the right, you can really see they're everywhere. You can even see them over here, okay? Um, <clears throat> they actually help to stick the bacteria to a surface. So we've kind of mentioned biofilms in chapter um, one, and this is one of the ways that they kind of anchor themselves and attach themselves almost like Velcro down to inanimate objects like the um, medical tubing. Okay. These can also help them attach to a host cell, 
which can contribute to things like disease. If I can't get this thing off of my cell, it would probably be a lot harder to get it to go away, okay? Um, it also helps with colonization because you've got these cells that are actually using these fimbriae not only to stick to the surface, but to stick to each other. So it makes it a lot harder to get rid of them because they're actually a, a group, okay? Another um, <clears throat> appendage that we're going to talk about is the pili. So the pili, which are here, these black structures that you see, okay, these are um, long, rigid structures. So they don't have any play to them. They're actually almost like a pipe, okay? And they are used for what we call conjugation, which is a type of mating that can happen between bacteria. So remember I said they're kind of like a pipe. I can actually use this puncture into a neighboring cell and then use that empty pipe to transfer something from my cell to the neighboring cell. I talked about um, the transfer of antibiotic resistance this is one of the ways that we can do that. We can actually make a copy of our antibiotic resistance and then use this pipe to transfer it to the neighboring cell, whether that is a bacteria of the same kind or whether it isn't. So um, outside of the cell wall, you might see something called a glycocalyx, okay? This is a surface coating. All right, it's a sugary coating, glycamine sugar, um, on the outside of the cell wall of quite a few bacteria. Um, the fact that you've got this kind of sugar slimy coating can actually help to form those biofilms. Um, I know I said this in face to face, but I can't remember now whether I said it on here. Biofilms are kind of like a slimy layer. The um, glycocalyx helps to form that slimy layer, okay? Um, you have two types depending on the composition. So the first type is called, oddly enough, a slime layer. It's a thin coating um, loosely attached to the cell wall. And then you've got what we call a capsule. This is a thick, dense coating it is firmly attached to the cell wall. <coughs> Sorry. And it's commonly formed by pathogenic bacteria. Now remember, a pathogen is something that can make you sick, okay? Something that can cause disease. So it provides quite a bit of protection from the immune system because you've got this, um, thick layer on top of the bacteria. So your immune system literally doesn't have access to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, to the bacteria itself. So if you look here at the plate on your right hand side, um, the top part of the plate up here, or not. Okay, good. The top part of the plate up here, okay, is non-encapsulated bacteria. Um, <clears throat> the bottom is encapsulated, okay? If you look at the bacteria up close, like under the scope, you'll notice that you've got these teeny tiny bacteria here. Here, however, the bacteria is in the middle of this big old blob of stuff. Okay, remember I said your immune system has a hard time getting to it? Well, you have to get through all of that before you actually reach the bacteria. Even when you look at this as a colony on a plate up here versus down here, you'll notice that the bottom right-hand side looks more like a blob of sugar or a, it's kind of looks like mucus. It's got that slimy appearance to it, indicating the presence of that capsule, okay? <clears throat> now, 
we've been going from the very, very outside with appendages, then we had the, the capsules. Now we're going to talk about the actual cell wall, okay? Okay, so why do we have a cell wall? Cell walls, like I said, are relatively rigid, meaning that they actually help determine the shape of the cell. Um, because it is as rigid as it is, like I said, it, it would be brick compared to straw, um, it gives more structural support. It is um, tougher. It is uh, more sturdy than a cell membrane. Also, one of the other things that we kind of expose things to is water. If you do not have something rigid that will keep your shape and you expose a cell to water with just a cell membrane on the outside, that cell will start to fill with water and kind of like an overinflated balloon, it would pop. So having this rigid structure basically means that the cell will start to fill with water, but once it hits the wall, it can't go any further. So this cell wall actually also helps to prevent a cell from rupturing, from overinflating because of osmotic pressure. Osmo, water. Always think water when you hear osmo. So osmotic pressure would literally cause the cell to in overinflate and eventually it would pop. So something that is unique to bacteria, because there are other organisms that do have cell walls, but they're made out of different materials. So with bacterial cell walls, you have a unique component called peptidoglycan. Okay. These are sugar chains cross-linked by peptide fragments. This allows your wall to be strong, but slightly flexible, okay? We have two major types of cell walls, okay? We've got gram-positive, and we have gram-negative, okay? In a gram-positive cell, the amount of peptidoglycan that you have is enormous, if you look here, see this big purple jelly-like thing at the top? That's the peptidoglycan. That's a huge chunk of peptidoglycan. Also, you have um, tocoic acids and lepotocoic acids within a gram-positive cell wall. Now, in gram-negative, see this little thing right here in pink? That little layer right here. That is the layer of peptidoglycan. If you compare left to right, you will notice that gram positive is about five times thicker than gram negative. Okay, so when we talk about gram negative bacteria, we talk about the fact that they have that thin peptidoglycan layer. They also contain um, LPS or endotoxin. And unlike this, if you look out here at the top, there's nothing on top of that peptidoglycan, but here there is an outer membrane. You'll see that you've got the two layers of um, phospholipids outside of that peptidoglycan layer. Gram positive doesn't have that. So anatomically, structurally, they are very different from each other. So I think I'm going to wait and get this in part three. I think that's the best way to do that.